just so you guys have a bit of an idea of the game plan, so I'm going to talk for roughly an hour or so, or 50 minutes or so. Um, that'll be the end of the testable material for the exam, and then we'll do a Kahoot review over what should be on the test, or at least give you some ideas. The nice thing about this section here, we've already covered all the drugs you're going to be using for the most part, right? This is what I'm talking about, cardio drugs, pull uh, double and triple duty in terms of what they can be used for. So this is going to be a good review for some of the stuff that we covered yesterday, including like our beta blockers and calcium channel blockers and all that kind of good stuff, okay? Any questions to begin with? And just a reminder, I'm sure most of you already watched the video that were posted yesterday for EpiBio because that was like an online blog that you guys all had. The videos were there if you decided to watch them. I haven't looked at the view count yet to see who's watched it, but um, I assume everyone did. I'm sure 63 views are, are there. Uh, but don't forget to, to keep up with that because that'll sneak up on you. And then we have like our journal clubs or review. You're going to be like, I don't know what any of this means. And you're going to feel not so great for the test. So I want you to feel good for all our tests, right? Okay. Anywho, so, uh, so no questions from the stuff yesterday. Continuing on, let's talk about our treatments for angina. So again, um, a lot of our patients will be developing, you know, with chronic hypertension, hyperlipidemia, all these things. You know, they'll develop this ischemic heart disease. And as I've already kind of alluded to, it's this disbalance between the oxygen supply and then the demand by the heart, right? So if we're not supplying enough oxygen to the heart, it's going to develop ischemia. If we don't if we have demand too much out of the heart, then it's going to get that ischemia exactly the same. Um, and so a lot of this is due to atherosclerosis, right? So this is where our drugs like our statins are going to be really beneficial from those pleiotropic effects we mentioned to help kind of stabilize those plaques and prevent them from getting any worse there. And however, we know that some patients are going to then progress and they can develop these acute coronary syndromes, which I'll talk about in a later section, which will probably be on the next test, or it can lead all the way up to acute MI. And then certainly um, what we're going to be focusing on here are more going to be these patients with kind of chronic, stable sort of angina, right? So again, people have that chest pain on exertion, but it should not be at rest, right? They kind of chill out and they stop moving around, then the chest pain should go away. But we'll look at some medications that can kind of help improve that amount of time or amount of exertion they can undergo before they experience those symptoms there. Again, kind of picture showing you here exactly what we're talking about. So again, looking at the availability, so how are we able to provide oxygen to the heart? Well, a lot of it is just, you know, obviously if you're not getting enough oxygen into the system, that's going to be a problem. Most patients don't have an issue with this necessarily, but it's more so to do the coronary flow and then distribution, right? So if you've got a big blockage there in one of those coronary vessels, that's where a lot of times the issue is going to be a problem here. O2 extraction can be an issue sometimes for certain types of poisons, but we're not too worried about that. And then on the other side here, we're looking at the oxygen requirement. So a lot of our medications may not be focusing specifically on the supply side of things, but they're going to be focusing on the demand sort of side of things. So what kind of drugs have we already talked about that could decrease the demand of oxygen by the heart? Beta blockers. Beta blockers. What else? Which type of calcium channel blockers? Yeah, primarily the non-DHPs. So we're going to see there is a role for dihydropyridines here in a, in a few moments, but the non-DHPs are the big ones because what do they do to heart rate and contractility? They decrease it, right? So, and what are the two non-dihydropyridines? Rapamil and deltaizem. Yeah, those are the two, two ones there. So anyway, so that's kind of what we're going to be focusing on here. So as you mentioned, um, looking at the heart rate, the contractility, that, that systolic wall tension there. So again, how kind of tight are those ventricles in terms of their compliance and things like that. And again, this is going to be a lot of a function of preload and afterload. So again, preload just meaning what's coming back into the heart. So again, who has a lot of extra preload? CHF patients have a lot of venous backup, things like that. Um, and then looking at the afterload side of things, we can see that by decreasing the afterload, which is usually done by decreasing arterial pressure, um, that we're going to be able to have the heart work uh, it's not going to have to work quite as hard in order to pump that blood out, right? So kind of by taking out some of those kinks in the hoses, it allows that flow to happen a little bit easier in, in those cases there. Um, so that's where you can see something like a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker may be useful because it's going to have good effects on decreasing afterload, right? Look at some other medications that can help out with that as well. Potentially, yeah, ACE inhibitors could help out with that. What's the other benefit of using ACE inhibitors in someone with, like, ischemic heart damage? Remember that remodeling that occurs due to angiotensin II, how ACE inhibitors can help to prevent a lot of that. So again, they can have some big benefits here as well. So um, again, we're going to find all these different uses, and we'll talk about some of the ancillary medications that can uh, be additionally beneficial. Um, again, you can find this angina can develop with really any degree of stenosis. Some patients may have almost no stenosis, and depending on if they have that vasospasm, we'll talk about that in a moment, how that can lead to some of that angina there. But again, uh, when you as you get more and more progressive, 
sort of blockage of those vessels, you're going to be more, more likely to see that ischemia develop unless you're more likely to see that chest pain uh, manifest. That angina, uh, the, uh, the variant angina, the Prince metal angina, those are going to be for usually like younger, healthier patients typically. And um, this is where you can find they'll have this sort of autonomic vasospasm of the coronary vessels that actually can even lead to things like ST changes in some rare cases. Um, Typically, you're going to find that this is going to be managed a little differently, and so we're going to talk very specifically about how we manage that in just a moment. So it's good to know how the treatment for, say, a Prince metal or a variant angina is going to differ between someone who has true blue sort of ischemic cardiac disease, right? So obviously, we know there's risk factors associated with this. When I say non-modifiable, what does that mean? Can't do anything about it, right? I can't change your age, unfortunately, right? And I can't do anything about your family. You can pick your nose, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family, right? You just got to deal with it. Um, modifiable risk factors, though, those are things we can do something about. So, for instance, getting them up and getting them active. Now, why might this be a problem for patients with angina? It's going to exacerbate the angina, right? So this is one of those things where when looking at exercise tolerance, we mentioned things like beta blockers, you know, if you used it in a young, healthy patient, like that's actually going to decrease their exercise tolerance because they can't supply blood flow to the areas where it's needed in the sort of more sympathetic sort of state versus here you're going to find that by decreasing the oxygen demand by the heart, by kind of slowing it down, decreasing um, the speed and the force of contractility, you're going to find um, that actually can enhance how much exercise they can do before they end up inducing that chest pain there, right? Certainly things like managing diabetes. Um, what do you think tobacco consumption might affect angina? What do you think what does nicotine do to blood vessels? They typically constrict, right? They have more of a uh, hypertensive effect than they do otherwise, right? Then, then they have a vasodilatory sort of effect there. So that's one thing you can consider. Uh, obviously, getting their hypertension under control, their obese, you know, things like that. So those are all things we would want to focus on. We've covered a lot of meds that can help out with some of those things there. Um, obviously, our goals when treating them is to try to prevent an acute coronary syndrome, right? That's the thing we'd like to prevent them from moving on to, or if they've had a previously prevent another episode, and then obviously relieve and prevent any symptoms. So that's that quality of life sort of thing there. And so looking at this, we're going to find that there's a couple ways we can attack this. So one, we can decrease the O2 demand, as I've already mentioned. So either by decreasing heart rate, contractility, or by decreasing that wall tension. So that means either decreasing preload or afterload. Now, what's the way when, how we can decrease preload? I heard someone say something. It sounded right. Diuretics. Diuretics could be one way. So get rid of the, the volume could be one way. What's another way? What if I dilated the veins such that they could carry more blood, right? They can hold more volume. Those are capacitance vessels. What if I increase the capacity, right? So there's a couple of meds that we can see that will, will help with that. We already mentioned diuretics is just getting rid of that volume. Uh, that could be one way. How about the afterload, as we mentioned? What can do that? Visodilators, antihypertensives like your ACE inhibitors could help with this, dihydropyridine, calcium channel blockers, you know, all those things that help to dilate the vessels are going to be useful to help decrease in that afterload. Good. And then obviously if we can stabilize any of those plaques, which is where things like our statins are going to be coming into play, that can be useful. If we can do things like provide aspirin for patients who have had maybe a previous coronary event, we can help give them aspirin to prevent that platelet aggregation from causing another blockage, that can be useful. And then obviously if we can reverse any of those modifiable risk factors, that's going to be uh, that's going to be helpful there too. So how do we actually treat it? Well, certainly you can go in and just open up the vessels, right? You can kind of give them the, the old rotor rooter sort of treatment there and clean out the vessels. They so have the PCI. You can do a stent potentially. You can do cabbage. We're actually putting a new vessel in uh, to bypass that. That's one thing. However, obviously this is a farm class, so I'm going to focus on lifestyle changes, right? No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to focus on drugs. I like drugs, as it turns out. Um, so we're going to look at things that are going to either be vascular protective, meaning they help to stabilize those clots and maybe pre or plaques and prevent future ACSs from occurring. And then we'll f have a heavy focus on the anti-anginal. So things that either will help to prevent angina from developing or things that can acutely treat it. So just like you have patients with asthma who have a quick acting medication to treat an acute attack, they also have controller medication that prevents them from having an asthma exacerbation throughout the day. Similarly here, you're going to find there's medication to help prevent an acute anginal attack and then things that we can use to treat an acute episode. It's important to understand the differences there because the same, uh, it's not always going to be the same medications as we'll see, okay? So with the pharmacology, what we're going to do is focus on decreasing the heart rate, contractility, that wall tension. The things that are going to help with this includes our calcium channel blockers, our nitrates, and then our beta blockers. And then in doing things to help increase coronary blood flow, this is where we're going to have things like our calcium channel blockers. And this is more so focusing on the dihydropyridines. Nitrates help with this, and we'll look at the nitrates as a class. That's kind of going to be one of the new set of drugs we haven't seen before. And then things like aspirin and clopidogrel, and how are those going to help with 
coronary blood flow. They prevent the platelets from aggregating and causing and aggravating the heart, right? By aggregating. And they're going to prevent a blockage from occurring there, right? So again, that's part of that secondary prevention. So if, for instance, if they have like a bare metal stent placed or a drug eluding stent placed in the vessel, platelets like to bind to that and aggregate. By giving them antiplatelet meds, you can prevent that and keep that vessel patent, right? Um, so those are things you're going to be looking at from that standpoint. We've already talked about those drugs, so we won't have a big focus on that. Um, but again, we'll, we'll see where their place is in therapy. So the antianginals, they should be able to help improve that exercise capacity. So again, when you ask them like, well, how much, you know, what can you do before you start to have chest pain, right? Those are gonna be the things you're looking at in terms of function to see how well your medications are working. So look for those deltas there to see, okay, well, what's working for you, what's not working for you. Um, also, we can look for things like those ST and or exercise induced ST changes. We're gonna be cognizant of that. Um, and then obviously things that can help decrease the frequency of symptoms. So these are better sort of controller medications that will be taken chronically that should be lasting throughout the day to help improve that exercise capacity. Things like your beta blockers, we'll look at our calcium channel blockers, and again, we'll divvy those up into dihydropyridines, non-dihydropyridines to see how they'll kind of compare and how they work. And then obviously our nitrates are gonna be the last thing we'll talk about here. So, um, and again, based on when they have symptoms, if there are symptoms at rest or how much activity they have to have, that's how you end up grading uh, the angina there. Obviously, if they're having symptoms at, at rest, that's a pretty bad sign, right? It's an unstable angina. You need to do something about that right away. Um, but certainly, if rest is able to kind of reverse their symptoms or uh, say they take a quick acting medication that helps to fix it, then, then they're generally okay, but they're going to be one of these sort of later stages. But, that's for CHF specifically, right? So with CHF, that's just when you develop like dyspnea on exertion and things like that, or de depending on how much you know, actual um, decrease in LV function, you know, things like that you're gonna be looking at. So it's a little different, it sounds similar because it's all based on like when you develop symptoms and if you have symptoms at rest or not, things like that, but they are slightly different. Yep. Anywho, um, so getting into beta blockers, let's look at what they're gonna do both on the demand and the supply side of things. For the demand side, beta blockers are gonna help to decrease heart rate, they're gonna decrease contractility, and also they're gonna have the additional benefits uh, on the wall tension by decreasing systolic blood pressure, right? So it's gonna help with the afterload side of things. And also they may actually help out with LV volume. And so what do you think, why do you think that is? More time to fill, absolutely. So again, by slowing down the heart rate, you're gonna see that you give the ventricle more time to fill. That's gonna have a little bit more of an efficient pump there. And so that's mainly how the beta blockers are gonna be working here. Notice here, they don't have any direct effect on oxygen supply. They don't do anything really to the coronary vessels to dilate them. Specifically, no effect on the supply side of things. Typically, beta blockers end up being your first line in the absence of any other contraindications. And what would be some contraindications of beta blockers we mentioned? The history of asthma, although that's a relative contraindication, right? Because there's certain beta blockers we could use, correct? Maybe? Yes. Like what? Which ones could we use? Beta 1 selective. How do we know those? A through N, right? What are some examples? Atenolol, ace butylol, metoprolol, natalol. I'm sorry, not natalol. I was on the N through Z part. A through M, right? Anyway. Even my own mnemonics fail me sometimes, but that's okay. It's usually my just age addling my brain like moths <laughs> eating holes over time. But anywho, um, generally a beta blocker should be first line, right? So again, what's another contraindication you would see to a beta blocker? Yeah, if they're already bradycardic, they have heart block, things like that. Those are going to be reasons why you would not want to use a beta blocker for those patients there, right? Um, again, you're going to find that also post-MI, most of these patients need to be on a beta blocker anyway because we see that does improve mortality, okay? So you get those additional benefits as well, which makes sense because they decrease the oxygen so, uh, demand by the heart. And so typically, you can either use a non-selective or a beta-1 selective. It just depends on the patient there. As I mentioned, beta-1 selective agents like metoprolol, atenolol, those are totally fine. Non-selective agents like nadolol or propranolol. Again, what did we mention about propranolol? Who might that be a bad choice in besides an asthmatic patient? We talked about like the lipid solubility being an issue. Yeah, remember like for elderly patients, it can worsen dementia, get them really bad uh, nightmares, hallucinations, things like that. Um, and then we mentioned our third generation agents. Remember, those are some of the exceptions we mentioned that are not really selective. They're not really beta-1 selective, but they do have those ancillary benefits. So for instance, like labetalol had what additional benefit? 
a little bit of beta 2 agonism sort of effect there, right? Have a little bit of alpha 1 antagonism. Carvedilol has some alpha 1 antagonism, right? So, um, and again, we'll see these come up again when we get to um, talking about CHF treatment. But really, any of these beta blockers would work. It's just going to be dependent on the patient. So, if I asked you a test question and I said, you know, a patient has a history of COPD with reactive airway disease, which one of these would be good first line treatment for prevention of anginal symptoms? you would not select the non-selective beta blocker, right? Because that could exacerbate that or maybe make their short-acting beta agonist not work all that too well. Okay, those are things you want to think about. Obviously, we mentioned our contraindications. So if they're already hypo hypotensive, if they're already bradycardic, if they are in de uh, acute decompensated heart failure, because again, beta blockers will put patients with heart failure into an exacerbation if you're not careful. You'd be very, uh, very cautious when they're using a negative inotrope in those type of patients, but we'll talk about that in a later section. Uh, and again, be aware of who to be uh, have precautions in. And why, why did I mention diabetes? Why is that a problem? So remember, it could cause... Hmm? Yeah, so one, it can mask the signs of hypoglycemia, like the, the tremors and the sweating and, all, and the tachycardia. It can block those symptoms. Also, what does it do to, say, say like a type 2 diabetic patient? Cause hyperglycemia, right, which is going to be an issue for them anyway. They're probably already having trouble with it because they worsen that in the insulin resistance because it actually decreases insulin release to some degree. So you can just be aware of who to be cautious in using medications. All stuff we've already covered yesterday. Again, the side effects have not changed at all here, right? So bradycardia, hypotension, etc. And I mentioned using the more lipid soluble agents, you're more likely to see those CNS sort of effects there, right? And again, why do we say avoid rapid discontinuation? Rebound hypertension, right? So again, if you've been on it for a while, due to the upregulation of those beta receptors, you've got to slowly wean them off of that, right? So that's one thing you want to be careful of, especially in patients you're worried about having um, any sort of um, compliance issues with, right? So getting into our calcium channel blockers, let's look at the differences between the DHPs and the non-DHPs here. And this should already make pretty good sense based off what we talked about yesterday. So for instance here with DHPs, notice what, they, what effect they might have on the heart rate. Does that sound like a good thing for a patient with angina? No. So typically, DHPs will not be used by themselves for treatment of angina. These are good as an add-on agent, but not good by themselves because they do have that tendency to drop the TPR, or the total uh, peripheral resistance, and that does cause an increase in cardiac output as a response to that. So generally not good by itself. However, you will see that it has you know, pretty marginal effects on contractility, but the biggest thing that it does is it helps out with reducing the afterload. You're going to find that it will drop the systolic blood pressure, which is good maybe kind of marginal effects on the LV volume because you're going to find that um, it may help to decrease a little bit of the, the venous uh, constriction, but again, very minor effects that you're going to see there. The biggest thing is just going to be the effects on the systolic blood pressure, okay? So, and the non dihydropyridines are, are another story altogether because they do have that direct cardiodepressant effects here. So by decreasing heart rate, decreasing contractility, and blood pressure, because they still have arterial or effects, these are really good first-line agents. So if you had a patient who could not receive a beta blocker, guess what? Calcium channel blocker and non-DHP could be a really good backup option there, okay? Now, again, if you have a patient who's like post-MI, these don't have the same kind of evidence to show reduced mortality like a beta blocker does, so this is why they get kind of reserved as a backup agent if a beta blocker is not appropriate, okay? Now, here you're going to find that they will have caused some mild uh, dilation in some of those coronary vessels, so in those cases there, they help a little bit with the supply side of thing. Also, they can help with that vasospasm, and this is more predominantly with the DHPs, so if you have someone with like a variant kind of uh, angina, that Prinz metal angina, this is where using a calcium channel blocker helps block a lot of those vasospasms. And so that's actually one of the first line treatments for that particular type of angina. Does that make sense? Because again, for those patients, it's not really an issue of oxygen demand by the heart, it's more of this, their vessels are, are spasming down, causing a decreased supply. So if I give them a calcium channel blocker to prevent that spasm, that will then ensure they have adequate flow, okay? And again, this uh, is going to be a picture here kind of showing you the, the, the differences. Um, again, I'm not going to quiz you specifically on did this one have two pluses or three pluses. I don't care if you know that, but I want you to know the general principles here. And again, this makes sense based off what we talked about yesterday. So will the, non -di or the, will the dihydropyridines have any effect on AV conduction? No, because they don't work directly on the heart. They mainly work on the arteries, right? So again, we know these things. So as I mentioned, Typically, non-DHPs are going to be good for when patients are uh, either contraindicated or they don't tolerate the beta blockers very well. This is where your non-DHPs can come into play here. And then typically, DHPs like amlodipine, nifedipine, things like that are going to be an add-on to patients who are already on a beta blocker and need that additional help, right? They need that additional drop in their systolic blood pressure to help with that afterload. Now, would I ever have a patient where maybe they weren't responding well enough to, say, diltiazem by itself, and then I would add on amlodipine? 
no, don't use two different types of calcium channel blockers together. That would be not a good idea because then you're going to see too much of a drop in that systolic blood pressure and get hypotensive. It's no good. So don't combine two different types of calcium channel blockers together. It's not going to be good. Is there ever a time when I'd use like a non-selective and a selective beta blocker together? No, you wouldn't do that either, right? Doesn't make any kind of me mechanistic sort of sense there. Okay. Um, now again, if the patient had pretty significant LV dysfunction and maybe they're not a good candidate for either a beta blocker or a non-DHP, then this is where something like an amlodipine could come into play. It's where a dihydropurine might be okay, because again, you don't want them to have any worsened uh, LV function based on the negative inotropy and chronotropy caused by those other two classes there, okay? So as I mentioned, non-DHPs for initial treatment, DHPs can be combined with a beta blocker, and we typically like to avoid short-acting agents, things like mifetapine, unless it's in a long-acting formulation. You don't want to cause quick drops in blood pressure, because again, what does that do to the heart rate? Yeah, it causes it to, to cause cardiac output to go up and that increases the oxygen demand. So typically, you'd like to use nice long acting agents that have kind of consistent effect throughout the whole 24 hour period. Again, contraindications here are going to be pretty similar to the beta blockers, especially for, uh, in terms of the non DHPs. As we mentioned, it's already hypotensive, bradycardic, et cetera. So be careful with that. And then remember our CYP3A4 interactions. Which ones were we concerned with causing CYP3A4 inhibition out of the calcium channel blockers? Diltiazem and verapamil. The non-DHPs will inhibit CYP3A4. Okay. Did the dihydropyridines do it? Nope. But they are substrates for CYP3A4, so other drugs could come and affect them, right? What if I had a patient who was on amlodipine and I had to start rifampin on them for endocarditis for whatever reason? What would happen to levels of amlodipine then? Go up or down? Sort of rifampin. That's an CYP3A4 inducer. So levels of amlodipine would do what? Yeah. Go down, right? Again, that's kind of the first inducer we've really seen so far. We can into a lot more of those. We can into like the neuro section later on, but that's kind of the first one, so it would be a notable thing to, to think about there. Versus if I said, oh, they started drinking grapefruit juice along with their amlodipine, levels would do what? They would go up, because that's a CYP3A4 inhibitor, PGP inhibitor, right? Good. So again, side effects we already talked about. Remember, we see a lot of flushing associated with these. What about the GI tract? What do you expect to see? Constipation, right? You can see a peripheral edema developed there, so do be wary of that. Um, again, educate them on the sort of thing. Make sure they are aware what kind of side effects to expect and what sort of things are rare, but still things that they need to be calling you for, or maybe things that prompt discontinuation of the medication altogether, right? Okay, and then next we're going to talk about our nitrates. This is kind of the newest class of drugs we're going to be talking about here. Not that the fact that the drugs are new, nitrates are quite old, um, but it's new for you, right? So this is where we're talking about it. The nitrates are going to be specifically vasodilators, okay? But they're really good at dilating the coronary vessels. So they really don't help a lot on the demand side of things, but they really do help on the supply side. So they'll dilate coronary arteries, they'll relieve vasospasm, and they also themselves have a little bit of an antithrombotic sort of antiplatelet sort of effect, okay? We're going to see how these work uh, specifically. And so basically what happens here, if you can imagine this being one of the coronary vessels, right? So we're kind of seeing inside one of the coronary vessels, nitrates. Anyone know what the primary nitrate we use is? Nitroglycerin. You know what happens when you get three nitroglycerins, you rub them together? It's trinitroglycerin, they blow up, right? Just kidding, that doesn't happen. TNT, right? Trinitroglycerin. Tri anyway. Um, <laughs> I try not to tell you as TNT, but anyway, so, but that does show you that the drugs themselves are actually quite unstable as it turns out. So they actually do break down. That'll become important and an education point we'll talk about in a moment here. Anyway, um, so look at nitrate. So what they're going to do is donate nitric oxide. Now, is this the same as nitrous oxide? What is nitrous oxide? Uh, Laughing gas, right? You can put it in your car and then go super fast. I got told yes, so yesterday, and this is a slight tangent, but um, I had to go to the Subaru dealership to have my car worked on because they did a repair, they did a recall on it, and then the recall needed to be recalled because they screwed it up. <laughs> but then I had like my brakes were starting to squeak a little bit, and I'm like, why is my brakes squeaky? And they, they said, oh, because you're not driving it hard enough. I like, go, what are you talking about? And they're like, no, you have to like drive it harder. These like performance brakes, you really got to put them to their paces. I said, so I, I need to like channel my inner Vin Diesel, and they said, exactly. Okay, I guess I'm going to do that. So maybe I'll get some NOS and put it in my car and see how that works. Okay, I'm not going to do that. Anywho, so nitrate. So they're donating nitric oxide. Nitric oxide gets converted or helps with the conversion over to cyclic GMP. Now we've talked about cyclic GMP before. It's an important secondary messenger system here. But basically what they're going to do is cause 
a decrease in the site of salt calcium, okay? Decreasing the amount of calcium coming into the cell, decreasing the amount of calcium being released from that sarcoplasmic reticulum, what does that do to the smooth muscle? It relaxes, right? It needs calcium to cause that contraction, so by relaxing that, by decreasing the calcium, we're going to see the coronary vessels will then open up, which is what we're looking for. Also see that vasodilation, see blood pressure. What other side effects do you think you could see with that? Hmm? Flushing, certainly. What else? Headaches, certainly. You dilate those cerebral vessels, get all that pounding blood flowing in. It's going to cause a headache, right? What do you think it does like other smooth muscle? What about, say, like, for instance, like your esophageal sphincter? What did? You can get GERD symptoms, right? You can actually loosen that lower esophageal sphincter and see GERD symptoms, right? Because of the fact that you're, you're decreasing the contraction, not just of the coronary vessels, but all smooth muscle can be potentially affected here. That's another big one you might see. Anyway, so remember we talked about our uh, medications for erectile dysfunction. This is where they actually directly interact here. There's an enzyme called phosphodiesterase, or PDE5, and it actually breaks down cyclic GMP. So if I have something that inhibits phosphodiesterase 5, guess what happens to my levels of CGMP? They increase pretty drastically. And this is a really important thing to consider here, is that when you have patients who are on nitrates, or actually, you have patients who are on medication for erectile dysfunction, you cannot give them a nitrate at the same time. Because what happens? They get profound hypotension, and then what does that do to their blood flow to the heart? Because it's all been pulling out everywhere else, right? So again, you're going to decrease even further the oxygen supply to the heart, and then you can worsen the ischemia. Not good. Because again, what do people normally, or what are they doing before they develop chest pain? Vigorous physical activity. And people who are taking medication for erectile dysfunction, what might they be engaging in before they have chest pain? <laughs> Vigorous physical activity. So when they call 911 because they have chest pain, and the EMS gets there, and their go-to is to say, give them a nitrate, they have to ask the question. Are you taking anything for erectile dysfunction? This is why we ask those questions, because if they don't ask the question and they are taking it and they combine the two, you see the hypotension. And then we're having to give them something else just to counteract the side effect. Okay, this is why we ask these sorts of questions there if you ever if you ever heard of that before. Anywho, so nitroglycerin is going to be the primary go-to. This is a quick-acting sort of rescue medication. So this is not something they'd be taking throughout the day. It would only be taken when they have an acute chest pain. Okay. So this is like using an albuterol inhaler if you have asthma, right? For, for an asthma attack, we need to treat that quickly. This is what this is going to be doing. On the other hand, though, the beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, are they quick acting or are they going to be more for kind of chronic prevention of anginal symptoms? Chronic prevention, right? So it's good to know, is this better for maintenance of symptoms or is it better for acute treatment of symptoms? And this is where this is seeing the acute treatment, okay? So keep that straight. Um, Typically, we're either given this as a sublingual tablet or a sublingual spray. Here's a spray here you can see. Um, we also have IV formulations that you can administer as well, right? So why do you think we have to give it sublingually or IV? What does that tell you about the bioavailability of the drug? It's not great, right? So again, that's why we don't tell them to swallow the pill. We want to make sure to tell them, hey, put this underneath your tongue and just let it dissolve and absorb on its own, right? And also, what's the benefit of using, say, a sublingual or buccal right of administration? Bypass the first pass effect. The liver doesn't take any tax off of it, right? So you go straight into the system directly so they can dilate those coronary vessels, okay? Now, typically what you'll tell the patients to do is they'll um, do one of these sprays or one of these tablets underneath the tongue, and then they will typically repeat the dose every five minutes, okay? Now, we used to tell them, hey, go ahead and take three doses, and at that point you don't have any relief of symptoms, then go ahead and call 911. What do we tell them nowadays? If their chest pain is not getting any better after the initial five minutes, go ahead and keep taking the nitroglycerin, but call 911 then, right? Why do we do that? Because if you're starving the heart of oxygen, time is tissue, right? So the more that tissue is going to be dying off, you want EMS to show up early, right? So this is why we sort of tell them, hey, after the first five minutes, if chest pain is not abated, then go ahead and call 911 at that point, right? Um, because you have stubborn patients who won't want to do it. They're like, it'll be fine, the next pill will work, the next pill will work, and then they're 20 minutes later and it's like, the heart's still just just crying for that oxygen, right? And so then at that point it might be too late to, to cause, you know, to prevent some of that reversible effects, or the irreversible effects. So anyways, those are important. Um, again, let the patients know that this can bottom out the pressure. So they really be careful when they're, say, going from sitting to standing, especially after they take an acute dose, because you will see pretty profound effects there. And you really want to keep these in a nice, cool, dry place. Keep them in the original packaging. It's not so, a pro so much of a problem for the sublingual, I'm sorry, the, uh, the spray, but the tablets are a common thing. People want to put, like, pill containers and stuff. But as I mentioned, they're nitrates. They're inherently um, inherently unstable molecules, and they tend to degrade over time. Yes, sir. Uh, a little bit off, but uh, are they like do they dissolve in your skin, or are they absorbing your skin? You're taught like an EMS, right? If you have a pregnancy that like 
you don't want to deliver them, like you need to get them off before they can deliver. Mm -hmm. um, you need to put a nitro between their legs and have them hold close between their legs to like kind of reduce the contraction. So mm -hmm. I'm really like preventing them from trying to get it out. Interesting. There's a lot to unpack there. Uh, I've not heard that personally. I don't know what the efficacy of that is. That's interesting. I've never heard of someone using a nitro. Uh, we'll talk about dermal absorption and nitroglycerin. Absolutely, you can see that. Um, but I don't know if that's all that effective for preventing <laughs> someone from having a baby. It's very interesting. I also I wonder, like, you know, if, uh, what the, the receiving like providers think when they see that. Like, what in the heck are you doing, like, giving nitroglycerin? But I don't know. It's interesting. I'd say take the opportunity to deliver that baby. I'd say get that thing out of there, right? Well, it's like for like if they're coming out like the wrong way. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I've not actually looked into that. Maybe there probably is an up-to-date article about that if that's a thing. So maybe you can <laughs> check that out and then report back to the class. You left your homework. Um, anyway, so as I mentioned, uh, keep it in the original packaging. We actually will tell patients with the tablets, make sure they replace it every three to six months or so after opening to make sure that it's actually working. Because sometimes they'll have an old uh, set of pills lying around, they'll take it, and they'll either assume that the drug's not working when really the drug's just degraded to the point where if they were getting a, a full, fresh dose, then it would actually work a lot better. Um, for most things in terms of expiration dates on medications, I'll tell you 99% of them are bogus. This is one where they, the drug actually does degrade, and so you do want to make sure they, they replace those, okay? Again, tell them not to swallow it, just put it underneath the tongue, spray it underneath the tongue, and let it absorb on its own. So long-acting nit nitrates, we do have some long-acting formulations, and these are going to be better for maintenance of symptoms and prevention throughout the, the, throughout the day, similar to our beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. And so these are going to be good for patients. Either they're not getting full relief on beta blockers alone or maybe a calcium channel blocker, or if it, you need to use it as an adjunct. If they couldn't receive the other two, or if you need to add it on for some additional benefit there. Um, typically, you're going to find this is uh, used most frequently when this combination fails. That's when you're going to add on a long-acting nitrate um, because there are some issues with it, as, as we'll see in a little bit. Definitely not recommend, recommend it as monotherapy uh, just due to lack of efficacy as compared to these other agents. So the, the two we have that are orally uh, bioavailable, we have isosorbide mononitrate and isosorbide dinitrate. Notice here they have a relatively limited duration of action. Now, we mentioned something called tachyphylaxis before. You remember what that is? It doesn't matter how much more of the drug I give, I don't get any additional benefit out of it. So one of the things you're going to find with nitrates is that when you're using long-acting formulations, you have to build in a nitrate-free period that's usually 12 hours out of the day. Okay, so you want if you're using a long-acting formulation, say do 12 hours on, 12 hours off. So like for instance, with the isosorbide mononitrate, you just dose doses daily, right? So that way they get 12 hours of coverage, and then the other 12 hours, what happens? Well, not quite as covered, right? So that's, again, another reason why we don't like to use it for monotherapy. Using the dinitrate, maybe dose it three times a day, you'll get roughly 12 hours of coverage out of that as well, okay? So you're thinking, well, it's 12 hours of the day the patient's not being protected necessarily. Why, you know, when, when would you schedule that? When do you think? Yeah, so you want to schedule the medication when they're going to be most physically active and up and about. So if they're going to sleep at nighttime, then it's okay if they're probably going to be okay if they don't have any coverage for that evening period, right? So if they work nights, though, taking nighttime would make sense for them because they're up and they're moving around, maybe they're working the ER overnight, you know, things like that. Those are the kind of considerations you want to make for your patient. When they're asleep, that's when they don't necessarily need the nitrates on board because that's when they're least likely to have anginal symptoms, okay? Uh, another formulation here is the nitroglycerin ointment. So this is kind of uh, alluding to what you're saying, like you can see absorption through the skin of this. And so we can actually use the nitroglycerin ointment, apply that to the skin, and have one of these little uh, patches over here. And you actually dose the medication similar to what we saw with the ophthalmic ointment. So we actually dosed it in inches. And so based on how much you're actually looking to get out of the patient, you'll be either doing a half inch, full inch, one and a half, depending on how much symptom really you're really looking at there. And it roughly equates to about 15 milligrams per inch or so. Um, the normal dose, like a sublingual, was like 0.4 milligrams, so this is a decent amount, but it gets absorbing throughout the day. And you need to have 12 hours on, 12 hours off, but otherwise if they keep applying it continuously, what would happen if they have acute chest pain and they take one of those sublingual nitros? Probably not going to work all that well, right, because they have basically depleted a lot of those cofactors and the drug's not going to be much more effective then, okay? So basically will squeeze it onto the paper and then you apply that onto the chest, a nice kind of two-by-two two sort, of, uh, sort of area, and you want to keep the cover of the applicator paper to avoid it being uh, transferred onto their clothes or other skin. Um, you make sure to wipe off any old doses before you apply the next one, okay? some patch formulations as well and this is actually an interesting thing so you have to make sure that um, as a healthcare provider if like your nurses or someone is applying this they need to make sure they're wearing gloves right because what would happen if they were not wearing gloves and they applied this to their skin 
can get dizzy because their blood pressure is dropping out a little bit, complain of headache. You know, so there's been cases that, and actually there's certain types of gloves, um, certain materials where the nitroglycerin will just go right through it anyway. And so even though they thought they had the right kind of gloves on, they did not, and they end up getting a really bad headache because of that. So just one thing to be aware of. So as I mentioned, the tachyphylaxis, again, a lot of factors we think may be contributing to this, but um, again, that's why we build in the 12-hour period where they have no nitrates available to them, and that will then replenish those factors, and then the next time you get the dose, it should work. I try to schedule that when they're less, least likely to have symptoms. Now, any uh, contraindications here are going to kind of involve... Um, you know, areas where we're going to be impeding blood flow to the system here. So things like aortic valve stenosis, uh, stenosis uh, obstructive cardiomyopathy, these would be cases where um, you don't want to necessarily dilate all those vessels to prevent uh, blood flow from coming through. And then as I mentioned, um, be careful concurrent administration with medications for erectile dysfunction. We'll talk more about this in the urology section next semester, um, but just be aware of that this is a potentially, you know, life-threatening uh, thing if you try to mix these two together. Really profound hypotension can develop there. So looking at this, this is a handy chart to go back and remember, like, how am I actually going to be using these medications? What's first line depending on their disease state here? So for instance, and in some of these things we haven't talked about yet, like CHF or MI, um, but these are things you want to kind of be wary of, right? So things like, you know, if they have hypertension, you know, beta blockers are a good standard first line to go with most of the time. Um, but what are some things you want to maybe avoid beta blockers in? Well, if they have diabetes, maybe I'm going to avoid a non-cardiospecific beta blocker, right? Or if they have asthma, maybe avoid that non-cardiospecific beta blocker. That's so what the NCS means there. Um, and then you can kind of see what the first-line agents are, see what the alternatives, and see what to avoid in those specific cases. Okay. Do you have a question? Mm. No, not really. So, you mean incontinence of urine? Yeah. Uh, I've not heard of any issues with that necessarily. Okay. Um, but certainly, if you think about like, the GI tract in terms of motility, that'll be slowed down, right? So, you see constipation with that, but I'm not familiar with any sort of urinary symptoms that could be related to that. Not that I know of. Okay, so some of our other sort of vascular protective drugs we want to make sure we're using along with these patients who have angina. Again, ACE inhibitors are really important here because they do help out uh, with the left ventricular remodeling they may be experiencing, especially if they've had previous MI or CHF. Uh, it's going to be useful for diabetic patients because what does it do for them? It protects their kidneys, absolutely. Um, and also helps out with the systolic blood pressure, right? So it can help out with the afterload in those cases there. So again, a lot of reasons why patients should be on an ACE inhibitor. So if they have one of these indications, you want to make sure that that is going to be part of their medication regimen, okay? As I mentioned, you know, consider if their patients are kind of maxed out on their doses of monotherapy. This is where we're going to start to combine things. Um, again, beta blockers plus a dihydropyridine is probably going to be the most common combination you're going to use there. Um, and just be aware of that. Uh, be aware of the potential for the hypotension that can develop with that. So be kind of cautious. Again, start low and go slow is always a good mantra for these patients here. Okay. And again, if they have a third agent that's needed, if you had to add on a long acting nitrate in addition to those, they probably need a better workup than what we can provide. Right. So again, thinking about going and actually have the, um, the angiography being done, seeing if there's anything they can do in terms of going to the cath lab, maybe that can help out as well. Okay. In terms of antiplatelets, uh, for the most part, patients should be on an antiplatelet agent here unless they have some kind of um, contraindication to do so. Uh, again, they've found that it's useful for helping to prevent, and more specifically, secondary prevention of MI. So they've had a previous heart attack or some degree of uh, cardiovascular disease um, or ischemic cardiovascular disease. This is where antiplatelet agents are going to be kind of found to be most useful here. Again, aspirin is going to be the most common, but some patients who can't take aspirin, like maybe they have an allergy or they have asthma and that can exacerbate it, then clopidogrel is a decent option as an alternative there, okay? So as I mentioned, unless they have contraindications, these patients should be on aspirin, most likely a beta blocker if they have previous MI, definitely an ACE inhibitor if they have any degree of LV dysfunction or diabetes, a lipid-lowering therapy, which is primarily going to be what? Statin. Statin, very good, and then sublingual nitro as needed for acute chest pain, okay? All the other medications will be scheduled throughout the day, right? Uh, sublingual nitro is going to only be for as needed for acute chest pain. What dose of aspirin are you going to give? 81 milligrams, right? Why, do, why just a baby dose? You have adult patients you're treating. It's irreversible, right? It's all you need in order to get a good inhibition of those platelets, right? Um, as I mentioned, for daily or more frequent symptoms, that's where you can consider using that prophylactic therapy where you're going to be getting the beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and perhaps your long-acting nitrates as well, okay? 
As I mentioned for the variant angina, this is where your dihydropyridines are going to be most likely to be most beneficial here. So again, by inhibiting that calcium influx into those uh, into those coronary vessels, you can prevent that vasospasm from occurring. So something like amlodipine is pretty good for this. Um, uh, however, avoid beta blockers because it didn't really do anything to the coronary vessels themselves and only decrease oxygen uh, demand by the heart. It doesn't really treat this very well. It can actually worsen symptoms in some cases there. Okay. So any questions on that? That's going to be the end of the test two material. Take a 10 minute break. We'll come back and then we'll do a Kahoot review. Okay. Uh, question, is it true that the closer a nitro patch is placed towards the head could cause a terrible headache and side effects, so a patch should be placed on the lower extremities to avoid such side effects? I have not seen that personally. Normally they place the nitro uh, patch or placed uh, on the chest. Uh, you can do it on the shoulder if it's a patch. Um, I'm not aware of that being a potential problem because, again, where's it getting absorbed into? The systemic circulation, so it's got to get into the venous side of things first, right? And then where does it go to? right side of the heart, and then where does that go to? The lungs, and where does that go to? The left side of the lung, or left side of the heart, and then it goes to everywhere else, like the brain included. So uh, in those cases there, I don't expect that it would have much faster of an onset or necessarily cause much more headache than you would be in place anywhere. I uh, will be happily proved wrong if you guys find anything uh, showing uh, something else, right? Um, and how life-threatening can a nitro uh, bit ointment become? I have heard stories of paramedics that would prank each other by placing ointment on the car door handles of ambulances. I thought I was skeptical if that was a real thing. Now, um, I can guarantee you probably some paramedic has tried that at some point. Uh, I've known quite a few paramedics in my days, and that definitely sounds like something they would do. Um, I'm not aware of that particular prank. I've heard some cases where people have tried to place Visine. Remember Visine? We talked about that back in Opto. They would put that into, um, there's one case where a, uh, a wife placed it into her husband's coffee because it was supposed to cause uh, significant diarrhea, not realizing the really serious cardiovascular effects it could cause, and I believe she went to jail for that. So uh, please do not give people medications without their consent. That is a big no-no, as it turns out. <laughs> Uh, please always get consent. Anywho, let us get to, let a few more people log in here. Although, you know, it's funny um, how education goes. When I was at the dealership yesterday getting my car fixed, there was a guy on his laptop next to me, and he had a, had a choir shirt on, and um, he said something about uh, teaching, and I was like, oh, are you a teacher? He says, yes, I do middle school choir. I'm actually working on like three cahoots right now. And I was like, I just finished my cahoot for my students. Like, <laughs> we compared notes. I actually put a few choir questions on, on this one. He put a few farm questions on his. I'm just kidding, he didn't do that. Although he was, he sounded like kind of a mean teacher because he was like, this is great. This is the only job where I get to make a bunch of 11 year olds cry every day. I said, oh man. Like, <laughs> oof. I was like, I usually, my students are a little older when they cry, but I do the same thing. So. <laughs> Okay, so let's get started. Oh, I do want to mention on the Adam Wooden, that's uh, a very funny name. However, one time I was at a, uh, I was in a cashier's line. I was going through and this lady was checking me out and she, I had showed her my card or something and she goes, oh, Adam Wood what? And I go, huh? And she goes, Adam Wood what? And I go, I... And, and she goes, oh, Adam would not get this joke. And I said, oh. No. Oof. Oof. That was serious burn. Uh, yeah. Anyway, okay, let's get started. That was a rough one. All right, so let's start. Which monitoring parameter and drug combination would be correct? Would we do thrombin time and fondaparinux? Would we do antifactor 10A and dabigatran? Would we do APTT and anoxaparin or PTINR and warfarin? Is that lifted up high enough so you guys can read it? Okay. What do we think? I'm only giving you 30 seconds on these because otherwise it'll just take forever. And so you guys should learn to be, should be, uh, you know, commit to an answer and go with it, right? Okay, so PT, INR, and warfarin. Good. Everyone should know that at the bare minimum, right? What's a good therapeutic INR typically? Most patients is going to be two to three. Who might require higher? Yeah, they have like a, a valve replacement, mechanical heart valve specifically, usually requires what range? Two and a half to three and a half. Two and a half to three and a half. Yes, absolutely. Good. So that would be good. Um, which one of these could I use anti 10 to monitor the effects of? 
So anti 10A, which one could I, uh, which drugs could I use to monitor with anti 10A? Phenoxaparin. Fondaparin should also be done because again, that's just, just an anti 10A inhibitor. And then what other drug? Hmm? Um, Zarelto, you tech, or I guess uh, theoretically you could. I've never seen anyone actually monitor with that, but uh, theoretically you could because it's an anti 10A inhibitor, right? Similar to Eliquis or Pixaban. Um, however, the other thing would be heparin, right? Heparin could actually also be monitored with that. Typically, though, what do you normally use to monitor heparin? PTT. APTT is normally what would you would do there, okay? Uh, Thrombin time is not clinically really used to monitor any particular drugs uh, in those cases there, okay? Now, why can't we use APTT for anoxaparin? Because anoxaparin really affects which two clotting factors mainly? 10 and 2, right? Think about driving. Heparin, however, will affect more of those clotting factors involved in that intrinsic pathway, and so because of that, APTT is a better monitoring parameter for that. And anoxaparin really doesn't affect APTT all that too reliably, okay? So that's why you would not monitor anoxaparin with APTT. Make sense? But you can use anti-10A for heparin because it does have pretty strong effects on that one as well, okay? All right. Continuing on. Uh, <laughs> which anti-lipemic would be best for a pregnant patient? Would it be cholestopol, rosuvastatin, azetamide, or gemfibrozil? So, which of our drugs? Antilipemic is another thing for anti. hyperlipidemic, I guess you could say. What do you get for a pregnant patient? I can feel the confidence oozing out of the crowd. <laughs> Okay, so let's look at why this is, right? So what's the problem with using a statin in a pregnant patient? Shh. Is there ever a chance you'd use a statin in a pregnant patient? No, it is teratogenic. Do not use it in a pregnant patient. Category X, right? Um, however, cholesterol fell into which category? Bile acid sequestrant. It's a resin, one of those resin drugs. Now, what kind of bioavailability does a bile acid sequestrant have? Zero, right? So because of that, it does not get any sort of systemic exposure. So the fetus is never exposed to it. So guess what? That's going to be the safest out of the bunch. Now, what are some problems with using a bile acid sequestrant? A lot of GI problems associated with that. Nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, cramping, right? And what do a lot of pregnant patients have already? Nausea, vomiting, <laughs> cramping, right? So again, this is why it's not going to be all that well tolerated. Again, you're kind of weighing the benefits versus the risk for those patients there, right? So again, uh, any of these other ones are not going to be preferred for those pregnant patients, okay? All right, moving on. Which beta blocker would be best for a patient with poorly controlled asthma? We just talked about some of those. Nematoprolol, sodalol, propranolol, or pendolol? Remember the mnemonic. I always love hearing that random, oh, or a random, oh, very good. See, remember A through M is typically going to be most of your cardioselective beta blockers, primarily blocking beta 1, such that they should not be a big problem for an asthmatic patient. Now, does that mean they're never going to have a problem with it? Not necessarily. It could be some patients who are a little more sensitive, where that selectivity is maybe not as great. That's where you can run into that problem there. However, all these other three are definitely going to be non-selective, okay? So any of them could potentially cause exacerbation of that asthma, okay? Fairly straightforward. Which of the following could have, uh, could cause cyanide toxicity in patients with liver dysfunction? Hmm. Would it be nicardipine, nitroprusside, tamsulosin, or phenoldepeo? Next, I don't think we even covered phenoldepeo, so you can rule that one out already. <laughs> Probably too late for that one, right? <laughs> the cardipine nitroprusside or tamsulosin? It was the yesterday question, it was. Wow, it was a pretty even split there between the two. It's almost like these drugs that look alike and sound alike are potentially prone to error, right? Absolutely, because I knew all of you knew it was nitroprusside, but because it looks so similar, it's easy to get confused. Illustrating that you got to really make sure you're reading labels and making sure that you have the right drug when you're, when you're using this stuff. Anyway, nicardipine falls into which category? 
What type of calcium channel blocker? The dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. No cyanide toxicity seen there. What kind of drug is tamsulosin? It was an alpha 1A blocker. Remember, it was good because most alpha blockers cause a lot of vasodilation. Uh, they're okay as adjunctive antihypertensives, but not great by themselves. That one was good because it really worked on the, just the prostate itself. And again, we'll talk more about that next semester. Um, Phenoldepane we'll talk about later. That was actually part of the, uh, the CHF section we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but nitroprusside, that was the one that was basically uh, nitric oxide, iron, like five cyanide molecules, right? Anyone remember the drug we give along with that to prevent cyanide toxicity? It's a good one to know too. So if you see those two together, we'll actually put them in the same IV bag frequently. But it's sodium uh, thiosulfate. Sodium thiosulfate is a drug we would administer along with that. It helps the liver to provide extra sulfate groups, so that way it can bind up that cyanide and you just pee it right out. Okay. All right. Which of the following is able to affect blood pressure and heart rate from the level of the CNS? Reclonidine, minoxidil, philodipine, or verapamil? Very good, yeah, so clonidine, remember what kind of category, what, what do we call that? It was an alpha, what kind of agonist? Alpha 2 agonist, it also will agonize those imidazoline receptors, but it works centrally, right, we call that a sympatholytic, so it's decreasing the activity of the sympathetic nervous system, right? So what kind of cardiovascular effects would you expect to see? The blood pressure should go down, down. heart rate should go down, right? Uh, what is the overall level of arousal or uh, awakeness? go down as well, right? Because again, it's working at the CNS, so sedation is a very common thing you're going to see with this medication there, right? Not something we saw with a ton of the other meds, as long as they weren't like really bottoming out your pressure. So that one's going to be working centrally. How about minoxidil? Where does that work? It's a direct vasodilator, right? It cause very profound hypotension. Uh, what does that do to the heart rate? It's going to increase it as a reflex, right? So remember all these different effects you can see there. How about philodipine? What kind of drug is that? Say, what kind of calcium channel blocker? Dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. What, what would that do to heart rate? Decrease it or increase it, right? Remember, when you cause that dilation to occur, because it's that DHP, you dilate the uh, arterial vessels, you're going to find that heart rate typically goes up as a response to that, right? It may only be a couple beats per minute, depending on the patient, but again, that is a reflex you're going to expect to see. Uh, and then verapamil would do what to heart rate and blood pressure? Decrease both, right? Because remember, that's going to be one of our non DHPs. It's going to be able to work on the heart and on the vessels simultaneously. Okay, so really, you would see, you expect to see something like clonidine and verapamil would have similar cardiovascular effects, whereas clonidine would have a little bit more of the CNS effects of sedation, uh, sort of semen. Also, cause like meiosis, and um, sometimes patients who overdose on clonidine actually looks a lot like an opioid overdose in, in some cases. There. Anyhow, Subaru's coming up. It's going to win. Uh, which antidote slash drug combination is correct? Would it be idarucizumab and aspirin? Would it be protamine uh, and heparin? Would it be bitonidione or vitamin K and anoxaparin? Or fresh fr frozen plasma and aspirin? Very good. So again, anytime I talk about antidotes, I probably will ask a question on that, right? Because I'm the tox guy, so there's an antidote I want, to, I want you guys to know about too. Um, what drug did uh, Praxbine work with? So Praxbine, think Pradaxa, that's that dibigatran, right? That's that direct thrombin inhibitor, one of the new oral anticoagulants. It's going to work on that, right? It's an antibody, monoclonal antibody designed to bind up that drug specifically if you have someone who's having bleeding with that drug, okay? Uh, vitamin K works on what drug? Warfarin. Okay, vitamin K and warfarin. What does fresh frozen plasma work on? Warfarin as well, right? Because you're replacing clotting factors that a patient's not producing. What would happen if I gave clotting factors to a patient who had, say, gotten too much heparin or noxaparin? Does that work? 
We'll say, no, why not? Because that drug would then go and inactivate those clogging factors I just put into the patient, right? So that's why it's very difficult to reverse some of these. Uh, and a lot of times we have to use something like protamine that will bind up the drug specifically, which is good for heparin. It works a little bit on an oxaparin, but not nearly as much. Most of the time, what do you do to fix the patient? Give them time, right? Try to, try to treat them supportively. Oftentimes, tincture of time is the best sort of answer that we have in a lot of cases there, right? Um, why would fresh frozen plasma not work on aspirin? Also, uh, what is aspirin effect? Platelets, does FFP have any platelets in it? No. Nope, it's a separate infusion, right? So again, that would have no direct effect on uh, aspirin, right? All right. Which of the following medications could worsen left ventricular function in a patient with CHF? We have a rapamil, ramipril, amlodipine, or propranolol. Interesting, there are two correct answers, but if you add up all the correct answers together, it actually, up to the other case, that's good. Um, good, so we're looking at amlodipine, so why would that not really be a problem for a patient with CHF? Does it suppress LV function at all? No, because it's what kind of drug? The DHP, right? So it's not gonna have any direct effects on the myocytes themselves, if anything, it'll kind of increase contractility because your heart's trying to get cardiac output to go up to account for the vasodilation that's causing. So that really wouldn't be contraindication. However, anything that's going to be a direct cardiodepressant, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, the non-DHP types, those are going to be the ones you want to be careful with. So for rapamil, platizum, propranolol, metoprolol, any of those would have problems. And this is why uh, when you start a patient on CHF, with something like metoprolite, so you go usually inpatient to monitor them, have very low doses and very gently titrate up to avoid one of those exacerbations, right? And then uh, ramipril, what would that do to LV function? Shouldn't do really much of anything, right? You typically are going to find uh, if anything it helps prevent that remodeling over time, so it could help to keep it healthier for longer, but that's really the main effects you see there, okay? All right. Next up, which of the following diuretics would exacerbate hyperkalemia? You see the zolamide, spironolactone, metolazone, or furosemide? Some of you look exasperated with thinking about exasperation. Exacerbations. Hard to keep those words straight. Very good, absolutely. So, uh, starting with the cetazolamide, what kind of drug is that? Uh, it's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, right? So, where's that working at in the, in the nephron? Proximal convoluted tubule, remember, because it affects the absorption of bicarb, and where's all that absorption of bicarb typically occur? Proximal convoluted tubule, right? Well, so almost everything gets absorbed, in the, uh, about 50% of everything gets reabsorbed in that proximal tubule. Uh, good, so that would actually cause some potassium loss, so that's not going to be uh, one here. How about metolazone? What kind of diuretic is that? That doesn't fit any of the naming convention, so that's not helpful, but it's going to be one of those thiazide diuretics. Remember what I say was special about metolazone? It actually works even at very low creatinine clearances. So most of your thiazides, once you get below, say, like 30 ml a minute, they don't work all that well. So metolazone would still be useful because remember that nephrologist I talked about that said you can make a rock pee? That's metolazone, right? So it's very good at doing that. Um, but that also causes potassium loss, and so that could only help, if anything, with hyperkalemia. And then the furosemide is what kind of drug? Loop diuretic. And loop di diuretics work where? Which part? Ascending loop of, of Henle, absolutely. So that's going to cause major potassium loss. So that would be potentially something you could use that would not exacerbate hyperkalemia. Uh, where do the thigh sides work? Did I mention that? Distal convoluted tubule, very good. And then, so last we have spironolactone, how does that work? 
So it's potassium sparing, how does it do that? The antagonist of what hormone? Aldosterone, very good. So an aldosterone antagonist, okay. So why does that cause hyperkalemia? So it's going to help stimulate putting more of those sodium channels in the collecting duct and cause reabsorption of sodium, but at the loss of potassium, okay. So that's why you see when I give an aldosterone antagonist, you're going to take away that effect and you're going to have more sodium excretion. Water goes along with that, but I'm going to have more potassium being held on to. So that's why you see potassium levels go up in the presence of spironolactone. What else could I give that could exacerbate hyperkalemia? Did someone say KCL? Yes, I would, that would do it for sure. What, what other diuretics could I give that could exacerbate hyperkalemia? You're technically right. That's the best kind of right. So what else was an aldosterone antagonist? Chlorlinone, right? How about what are the other potassium spraying diuretics? Triamterine, amylaride, I mean, all those could exacerbate hyperkalemia. What could I use as in terms of an antihypertensive to worsen hyperkalemia? ACE inhibitor or an ARB would do it as well, okay? Again, be wary of this because you have patients who have chronic kidney disease, they're going to come in with their potassiums all over the place, and you want to make sure you're not going to give them the medication that's going to tip them up to a K of 7, all of a sudden they go into V fib arrest, right? These are things you got to be careful with. Okay. Which medication would be recommended in a patient with just an isolated hypertriglyceridemia? The cholestyramine, ezetimibe, phenofibrate, or atorvastatin? So hypertriglyceridemia is really the only thing they had going on. LDLs looked fine. HDLs, okay. What could we give them? Uh, yes, phenofibrate. So phenofibrate falls into which category? And to the fibrates, absolutely. What else was in that category? Gemfibrazil, visa fibrate, those are all in that category there. So remember, what are their, their two main effects in terms of cholesterol? What do they do? They What do they do to HDL? Raise HDL, and they do what to triglycerides? Decrease those. Those are really good at those two things. What else does that have that similar pattern? Niacin does the same thing, right? Extended release niacin is good for that. However, what would something like cholestyramine do to your triglycerides? Can they increase it, right? So that would be contraindicated in that patient there. Now, a torvastatin wouldn't be wrong to give. It would still lower triglycerides. It just doesn't have the same sort of uh, isolating effects as something like uh, phenofibrate would. So that might, might be able to help out a little bit, but it's going to be weaker in terms of its actions than uh, either of those other two. Okay? Make sense? All right. Up next, we have a patient with chronic constipation. They should avoid which medication? Prozosin, dilpizem, bumetanide, or minoxidil? What do we think? <laughs> See the smoke coming out of people's ears? <laughs> so we can't take it anymore? You didn't answer, so I didn't look at it. <laughs> Very good, yes, yes, yes. Okay, shh. So why is that deltaism, why is that going to be bad for someone with chronic constipation? Why does it decrease gastric motility? Decreases calcium coming into those cells there, right? So it makes sense that that would cause constipation because if that calcium is not entering those, those smooth muscle cells around the intestine, it's not going to be all that motile. So in those cases, there are deltaism. Many of your calcium channel blockers will, will cause this for sure. Um, now, even though that has some vasodilatory properties, things like prozosin and minoxidil, they're both being either an alpha-1 blocker or a direct vasodilator. Them both can cause smooth muscle relaxation. It doesn't really affect the GI tract so much as the calcium channel blockers do. That would not be a problem. Bumetanide, what effect would bumetanide have on calcium, do you think? To decrease it, good, because why, why would it do that? What kind of drug is bumetanide? The loop diuretic, right? So loop diuretics are going to cause you to lose calcium, potassium, sodium, magnesium. A lot of electrolytes are going to be lost there. So hypocalcemia could potentially occur as a result of that. But really the, uh, the big thing is just 
constipation with calcium channel blockers has really a direct effect of those drugs. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, the diuretic effect not cause constipation? It could, but it's less likely to, right? So, again, we're trying to go like the best answer, not just like, because I mean, technically, there's probably someone who's had minoxidil and constipation at the same time, but as something we mentioned yesterday when you were gone, well, watch the video. You'll we'll talk about adverse effects and how they end up on, on things there. It was a really good class you missed. That's, <laughs> Felt your presence not being I'll there. Be there. Yeah, absolutely. In spirit, <laughs> yes. It's fantastic. Make sure to like and subscribe. My guys. <laughs> yeah, leave a comment down below. Yeah, leave a comment down below. Actually, so again, I, for whatever reason, I'm, I'm a fairly awkward person by nature, if you haven't noticed. And um, but I end up striking up random conversations, especially when I'm at the car dealership. So I met the the choir teacher, and then also the lady who was like helping me out. She was like looking at my computer, and she's like, "Is that like a?" It's like a gaming laptop, and I was like, eh, it's a gaming laptop. And then she says, oh, like, can I do, like, video editing? I was like, actually, I'm e editing a video right now for my students. She was like, no way. I want to make my own YouTube channel. I was like, I have my own YouTube channel. <laughs> I was like, it's super boring. Like, no one's ever going to watch it. But, uh, and then uh, I was like, what kind of videos are you, you going to make? And she was like, I want to do makeup tutorials. And I said, those are popular. I don't, I don't get some views, for sure. So do you do like smoky eyes and stuff? And she says, no, we don't do that anymore. And I said, okay. <laughs> I know little to nothing about makeup, as it turns out. Okay, uh, which of the following drugs can cause CYP3 for induction? I just gave this one away earlier. A Thambi oh, actually, this is a this is actually a poem question, but you should be able to get it anyway. You should know. Actually, you should know that from poem that you already took, right? <laughs> True. So I can ask you questions about these drugs, and you should already know something about them anyway. Uh, uh, uh. We'll see if you come up with the right answer for this. You wouldn't consider that in the weeds, though. Hmm? You wouldn't consider that to be in the weeds, though. Right? What do you mean in the weeds? In terms of this question and side effects? Don't get in the weeds. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, mean, I sometimes I like to hang on the weeds. It just depends. I don't, I don't get. I don't get your joke. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. I'm outside of it. Okay. Anywho, so looking at uh, our answer to yes, rifampin, we talked about that. We talked about it in terms of which disease state? Endocarditis, right? Why do we like to use that for endocarditis? Good synergy, right? And remember, when do you want to add it on? Like, is it the first drug you start? The last drug you start, why? Right? Because you want to prevent resistance from occurring, right? So the resistance to rifampin by itself tends to be Pretty, happen pretty quick, but if I start at last and the other antibiotics are kind of helping out, it kind of prevents that from occurring. Um, obviously, these other three drugs are used to treat what? TB, right? So good. So what kind of side effect would you see with ethambutol? What's kind of like pretty typical for that one? Red-green color discrimination is impaired, so maybe... I, I, I feel like a lot of Orlando drivers must be taking ethambutol because uh, I feel like they can't tell the difference in red and the green light. Anyway, um, so stand up a bit for you. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then isoniazid, what could you see with that? No, what causes orange fluids? That's rifampin, right? Isoniazid, though, is going to cause what? Peripheral neuropathies? Anyone know why? Actually induces a pyridoxine deficiency. So it's a B6 vitamin deficiency that can develop there. It can actually lead to seizures in some cases. So um, pyridoxine is necessary to produce GABA, and GABA is the main thing that kind of inhibits our CNS. And so you can actually see really intractable seizures with isoniazid potentially. But again, we'll talk about that in the poem section later on. This is an error on my part to even include this. But let's keep moving on. Uh, so a patient with endocarditis and culture show MSSA, which of the following antibiotics is most appropriate? So vancomycin, dicloxacillin, azithromycin, or linazolid? Oh, yeah, I spelled that wrong. Should be a C on there. I spelled it incorrectly, yes. Yep. Okay. Shh. So with a lot of these patients, if you don't know what the culture is going to grow yet, what do you normally start them off on? Vanco. Vanco is a good one to start with, but what did the culture show? MSSA. Do I need to go with that big gun of Vanco anymore? No. So the nasal is too broad a scope. Vancomycin, even though vancomycin is always the answer, in this case... 
Well, it's not wrong. It is not the most right answer, right? So it is what it is. Uh, azithromycin probably not going to provide sufficient coverage here for our purposes, but dicloxacillin would be appropriate because again, what is dicloxacillin? Anti-staphylococcal penicillin, right? So that's really its main niche right there is to treat MSSA. So that would be the most appropriate. Okay. Very good. <laughs> Next up, which medication can mitigate the unique side effect of immediate release niacin? Do I give torsamide, hydralazine, aspirin, or acetaminophen? What can I do to prevent this? Very good. Yes. So, shh. Why do you get uh, Why do you get flushing with niacin? Vessel dilation caused by caused by niacin. Yes, that is true. But why <laughs> does niacin cause vessel dilation? You guys are so technically right all the time. <laughs> no. Well, you know the right, the right answer. So, it stands the reason. What is an aspirin going to do for us? Inhibits. Synthesis of prostaglandins. Yes, yes, yes. Remember, what do we say the prostaglandins do in that afferent arterial? They dilate, right? So again, that's why you get the flushing because your vessels are dilating because of all the extra prostaglandins. So that is why aspirin is good to help prevent that from occurring. You take it beforehand. That way you prevent the prostaglandin synthesis. Thus, you prevent the vasodilation. They don't get all flushed and hot and sweaty, right? Okay. Again, what's the other way we can get around that? Don't take immediate release niacin, right? Take long-acting niacin. Uh, sustained release nice and is totally fine there. Okay, very good. Which anticoagulant works with antithrombin three to inactivate factors two, ten, nine, eleven, and twelve? Bondaparinux, anoxaparin, warfarin, or heparin? What do we think? I feel like I'm going to leave you guys nice and re-energized for your poem lecture coming up. I do. It's not me, no. I'm not qualified to teach CMS, come on. Okay, so the mechanism of action here is being described. So first off, you see antithrombin 3, you automatically should be thinking what? Heparins and low molecular weight heparins and Bond parent and high, yes, high molecular weight heparin is just heparin, right? <laughs> um, I think there's like a joke in Scrubs on one time where he asked, like, should I get unfractionated heparin or just like, I think high molecular weight heparin or something like that. And then basically the joke was, this is the same thing, basically. But anyway, um, so looking at this, yeah, so antithrombin 3, but again, look at the broad activity there. That leads you to think it's the high molecular weight heparin there, the unfractionated heparin working against all those different ones, because it was able to bind to more of those factors. Remember when you started to chop that down into smaller pieces, anoxaparin started to show a little bit more preference for which two factors? 10 and 2, right? Then if I chop it up even more to just a pentasaccharide sequence, what do I get? Just 10 activity, right? So what drug is going to be emblematic of that? Fondaparinux, right? So fondaparinux specifically is only going to work on factor 10, anoxaparin is more 10 and 2, and then heparin is going to be the most broad, infecting things like 9, 11, and 12. Make sense? So again, you got to know your mechanisms here. You got to know where these drugs are specifically working in order to get an idea of like one how we monitor, right? So that's why we use what to monitor heparin. APTT, right? That's why we use PTINR for warfarin. That's why we use ATT10A for anoxaparin. These are a reason for these things. It has to do with those mechanisms. Okay. Which of the following meds would most likely cause acute kidney insufficiency when initiated? Be prozosin, lisinopril, hydralazine, or clonidine. I spelled clonidine wrong too. The problem is that Google Chrome does not check all the medical spellings and stuff. So we plan idine, uh, adine. <laughs> Pretty even split here. So. Let's look at it. So the two big things that were going to cause uh, 
acute renal insufficiency, where when we were talking about uh, things affecting the afferent and efferent arterial, right? So remember, we talked about NSAIDs being a cause or precipitant of acute kidney injury because they did what? Inhibit cyclooxygenase, and that does what? To prostaglandin synthesis. Decreases, and that does what to the afferent arterial? Constricts it, right? So you have less flow coming in, so thus GFR goes down. Okay, so that makes sense. But lisinopril, why would that cause an acute kidney injury or insufficiency? See, all right, so you're decreasing production of angiotensin 2, so that does what to the efferent arterial? Well, angiotensin 2 normally constricts it, but if I take that away, it dilates, right? So I could have put herbisartan on here, valsartan, any of the ARBs will do this, any of the ACE inhibitors will do this as well, okay? None of these other ones specifically are going to cause a decrease in kidney function. I mean, certainly if you made a patient so hypotensive, uh, they're not going to perfuse the kidneys preferentially. But um, again, talking about normal sort of course of treatment, ACE inhibitors are going to be the biggest one on this list. Yes, ma'am. I know, you're like, wait a second, you just said you're supposed to give it to diabetic patients, but it can cause acute kidney injury. What do I do here? Again, it's a question of the more chronic use versus the acute use, okay? If I give a patient who has, say, stage 3 kidney disease a full-dose uh, ACE inhibitor, they're going to go into probably acute kidney failure, at least for the short term, right? Because, again, they need that angiotensin 2 around to keep that efferent arterial closed or uh, constricted such that they keep the GFR up. Okay. However, if I start a really low dose and I gradually titrated them up, their body gets used to that over time, and thus I don't induce that acute kidney problem, but overall, they can have that effect around and keep that glomerulus healthy for longer. Okay. So we're talking about long-term use versus an acute sort of um, uh, induction of this acute kidney injury here. That makes sense. Okay. All right. A potential side effect from use of evilocumab or rapatha is? Anaphylaxis, undetectable LDL, rhabdomyolysis, or infection. What kind of drug is this? Hmm. Interesting. There are actually two correct answers here. So very good for some of you to remember that esoteric point I made in that one lecture. Very good. Um, yeah, so what kind of drug is this? So right off the bat, you know it's a monoclonal antibody, but more specifically, what does it do? It's a PCSK9 inhibitor. What does that do? You're like, I don't know. <laughs> Causes undetectable LDLs. That's what it does. No. So remember, it prevents the recycling of those LDL receptors. So more of them stay present on the hepatocytes, so you take up more of the LDL out of the blood, right? So that's what these drugs are doing. They're very potent at dropping LDL. However, what do you think like the cost of one of these is compared to, say, torvastatin? Astronomically expensive, right? So usually it's going to be an add-on, or if they can't tolerate statins, this would be a decent drug to try. Uh, and some of the trials actually did find undetectable LDL, so again, very, very potent at what it does, okay? Anyway, um, rhabdomyolysis could potentially occur, but, or not necessarily with this drug, but more, more what class of drugs normally did this? The statins, right? Especially when the levels got too high. Um, and again, why do you see anaphylaxis with these drugs? The foreign protein, right? So again, it's a foreign protein. Your body may have a reaction to that, so you want to note that. Now, infection is interesting because um, a lot of the antibodies we're going to get into, especially when we get to the rheumatology section, will lead to an increased risk for an infection. That's mainly because they're working as anti-inflammatories, usually by binding up things like tumor necrosis factor and interleukin. We'll talk a lot more about those at a later date, uh, probably to rheumatology next semester or something, okay? All right. Next up, uh, sudden withdrawal of which medication could lead to severe rebound hypertension? Chlorothiazide, herbicidin, and lodipine or nadolol. I know we talked about this today. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, so Natalol can do that because Natalol is what kind of drug? Beta block, remember, chronically blocking those beta receptors leads to receptor upregulation. So if you withdraw that immediately, you can see a lot of extra sympathetic effect at the heart, and that can lead to things like hypertension, MI potentially, could be bad. 
Um, none of these other ones really have that same sort of withdrawal effect because they have a little bit more kind of direct action on their particular uh, components there. Now, what other drug could I put up here that would have caused a similar feature? Clonidine would be the other big one, right? Clonidine, guanfacine, any of those would be uh, also likely to cause a very similar sort of effect, okay? Yes, ma'am. Most, yes. Generally speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, usually antagonizing receptor leads to some degree of upregulation. Activating one usually leads to some degree of downregulation, for the most part. Very good. Next, uh, two questions left. Which of the following medications can help preserve renal function in diabetic patients? This should be very straightforward. We've mentioned it 9,000 times today. They play their happy tune because they knew they got the answer. I'll use that Yes. There's actually two right answers here, and no one picked the other right answer. Interesting. That's a really good point, though, right? Remember, it's not just the ACE inhibitors that help preserve kidney function in diabetic patients, it's also. ARBs will do this as well, right? So remember that each of those can be used um, practically interchangeably. However, what may lead you to choosing one or the other? They get the cough seen with the ACE inhibitor. What else? Stravangioedema. You still want to be cautious with the ACE, with the ARBs, but you know it's, it's something you could definitely consider there, right? Um, none of these other ones have that sort of kidney protective effects. Okay. And the last question is: A patient developed rhabdomyolysis after taking simvastatin, and what other medication? Cenopril, verapamil, ozetamide, or alirocumab. Interesting. Hmm. So what am I looking for here? Well, yes, I'm looking for Brapnel. Yes, that's the correct answer. But what? More broadly speaking, what's the concept I'm looking to illustrate here? I mean, you guys are so right all the time. Not quite as right as you need to be. Um, just kidding. No, you're very right. Um, what, what concept am I trying to illustrate here? What kind of interaction are we looking for? The SIP interaction, right? SIP3, yeah. 4 interaction, okay? So simvastatin is a substrate. You should know that because looking back at our list of statins there, there's a couple that would avoid that, right? So what was a good one that would avoid SIP interactions? Rosuvastatin, right? Because remember that was a good high intensity one that we could use. That one's very safe from a drug interaction standpoint because it lacks any of those SIP interactions, right? However, atorvastatin, simvastatin, they both have this uh, SIP interaction. So, I'm looking for something that's going to inhibit CYP3A4. Alarachimab's not going to do it. Zetamide, Sinopril's not going to do it. However, Verapamil will do this. And what else is going to do it? Diltiazem. Your non DHPs are going to inhibit CYP3A4, so be careful with that. What if I had amlodipine up here? Would that be correct? No, they'd both be substrates for 3A4, but the DHPs do not inhibit CYP3A4. Okay? Make sense? All right, so the winner is in third place, we have horse serum. Who's that? Very interesting choice of name. It's good. Uh, sugar teas. I don't know. I don't know who's going to admit to that. I'm about to say. Um, so to an anonymous answerer. Uh, and then S, just plain old S. Very good. Very good. A lady of few letters, but of many answers, as it turns out. And so your free answer for the test is A. This one A is going to be on the test, I guarantee. Uh, anyway, any qu actually, I can't guarantee that because they randomize the orders of the answers. So maybe you'll be one of those weird ones that get no A's, but hopefully you will. Um, if that happens, I'll give you a point back. Oh, there's no even no letters on there? Really? Oh, it's funny. Interesting. I'll give the whole answer. Okay. I'll tell you, the answer is bubble. First bubble. How about that? Huh? First bubble. Yes. 
Not the third or the fourth or the second, but the first bubble. Can answer. Anyhow, um, so any questions that have come up in the meantime? Let's look here on the board. Uh, have you ever seen an overdosing on laughing gas? I guess it's a new drug for teenagers to get high. Um, yes, yes and no. So typically nitrous oxide, you see a lot of abuse by that. Typically, like um, you see that more like with dentists or like dental professionals because they have kind of more access to it. Some anesthesiology personnel can sometimes be a little bit more prone just due to access to the medications themselves. However, there are a lot of other inhalants that uh, people may have access to that they could get them high potentially. So for instance, I remember like trying to buy like, you know, those little cans of dusted air or um, air dusters for like your computer parts or something like that. I remember trying to buy some from Walmart when I was like 17 and they're like, no, no, you gotta be 18 to buy this stuff. And I was like, why in the world would I need to be 18 to buy this stuff? And the answer is, because people will huff it and they'll get high off of it. People can huff Freon and get high off of that. There's all kinds of different things. Um, some people will get really nasty hypo, um, uh, frostbite and thermal injuries from trying to huff Freon off of AC units. Uh, there's just a whole lot of things that people will do to, to try to get high. Um, but that is something you could potentially see. Anyway, um, let's see, so I answered that one. I think that's pretty much it. Do you have any questions for the test? Anything at all? Anything you're not clear on? Again, study hard. I will be answering emails all throughout the weekend. I'll be running daddy daycare, uh, so I'll be available to at least answer some emails in between jumping in muddy puddles for Peppa Pig's request. Uh, nothing else? I will see you guys next time. <laughs>